Lecture 4-4, Plate Tectonics. The theory of plate tectonics states that the pieces of Earth's lithosphere are in slow, constant motion, driven by convection currents in the mantle. Now, we talked about continental drift, which was proposed by Alfred Wagner, but he didn't have a mechanism for motion. Plate tectonics goes beyond this and talks about the whole lithosphere. The lithosphere being the upper mantle and the crust combined. So the Earth's surface is broken into these plates, and they're in constant motion, either coming together, coming apart, or sliding past each other. And we can measure this nowadays, we can track the motions, we can show what's happening. But the theory of plate tectonics explains a lot of things. It explains earthquakes, volcanoes, mountains. It's one of these big, overlying theories that explain so much, have so much evidence for them, and they're so important to science. Now, important thing just to note right now is the theory does not mean a guess in science. It's important that you understand that. There's a ton of evidence supporting this, no evidence going against this. Now, you can see... A map here of the world and you can see the different plates that are making these up. So you can see in uh, North America here we have what we call the North American plate. We have the Pacific plate and this little guy here is called the Juan de Fuca plate. That plate is actually being kind of devoured by the North American plate and the Pacific plate. It's getting subducted under. Where we have these plate boundaries are actually where we find most of the world's earthquakes and volcanoes. The Pacific Ring of Fire, for example, which we can see here, is an area around the Pacific Plate where we have a lot of subduction taking place and we get a tremendous amount of earthquakes happening. We have a lot of volcanoes forming, that's the Ring of Fire name. And this actually helped us map the plates is by the activity of earthquakes and volcanoes. When we started mapping them out, we saw these lines. Now there are earthquakes and volcanoes that can happen away from plate boundaries. But the majority of them, we're talking well over 90% of all earthquakes and volcanoes, happen on a plate boundary. In this map here, you can see the general motion of the different plates, where we have a separation of plates here in the Atlantic. We have the African plate moving to the east, North American plate going to the west. We have here in California, we actually have the Pacific plate and North American plate are sliding past each other. And we see this on the San Andreas fault line. You can go up to the Himalayas here where you have two continental plates meeting and they're actually colliding together forming the Himalayan mountains. So you wonder why mountains can form. It happens due to plate tectonics. Now some terms we need to know as we go forward here. First fault is a crack in crustal rock where movement occurs. So this is a break in the rock layers below. A fracture is just a crack in the rock. A syncline and anticline are folds that happen because the plates are under pressure and so they end up folding. Here you can see a syncline, which is a downward fold. An anticline is an upward fold in the rock layers. An easy way to remember that is the letter A kind of has this upward motion, just like the shape that we see for an anticline. Now there are three types of plate boundaries that we look at, and they all have very specific geological features associated with them. A conversion boundary, the plates are pushing together, mountains form, uh, we also get what's called a subduction zone. And this is where a plate pushes underneath another when boundaries are converging, when they're coming together. The least dense plate will rise above the other one. So the least dense, dense goes to the top, the most dense goes to the bottom. To draw this out, we have one plate here getting subducted. It's moving to the right. We have another plate moving to the left. Now this plate here on the right side is has a lower density so lower density this one has a higher density the higher density plate gets subducted under now when this forms here we can actually get things forming like well as it gets formed down here it actually kicks up magma and that can cause a volcano to spew up or we can get earthquakes occurring at this location. So because of this force here of it getting pushed under, oftentimes we get a lot of shallow earthquakes. We can actually get some deep earthquakes. Uh, we'll actually get mountain formation happening off of the plate, so away from the boundary. But you also see volcano formation because this material here that made up the plate before is going to melt and form into magma that can easily seep back up to form new rock. This is an example of a divergent plate boundary. Um, you can see that the plates are spreading apart, 
So this one on the right side is going to the right, one on the left is going to the left. New material will form in the middle, so we can see new rock layers being forming. We can actually get magma to come up to the surface, so this is kind of what we'll see a lot of volcanoes forming deep in the ocean. Uh, we don't have many divergent plate boundaries on land, but there's one in Africa called the Great African Rift, where you actually see the land is separating. Eventually, will fill up with water, and it could almost form a new inland sea. A sliding or transform boundary is when the plates literally slide past each other. Often shearing as they go. Earthquakes are caused by these a lot of times. No new crust is being formed or destroyed. So we have two plates which are sliding right past each other. And they'll catch and build up pressure and also be released. And this will be oftentimes a very powerful earthquake. The San Andreas Fault Line in California is a sliding boundary. And we actually have instruments that we place on each side of the boundary that we can measure how much it moves. Uh, we use what's called a creep meter to figure out the motion. Now, the most important scientific explanations are often called theories. In ordinary speech, theories often use mean guess or a hunch. Whereas in scientific terminology, a theory is a set of universal statements that explain some aspect of the natural world. Theories are powerful tools. Scientists seek to develop theories that fit these four things. But the main thing you have to take away from this a theory is based upon evidence. It has to explain things. It has to connect other ideas. If there's evidence going against a theory, then it is either modified or getting rid of. A theory can be on the same level as a law if the evidence supports it. There are no accepted theories out there that are just accepted because the person states them. They have to be defended. They have to be able to withstand scrutiny from other scientists.